So if I get too loud, it's because my ears are full of water right now. <laughs> Feels like everything is echoing. I went swimming too much on my vacation, and I've been putting eardrops in it, and they say it's supposed to dry it up. Well, it hasn't worked in a week. So, <laughs> like, well, sooner or later it will. But um, we just want to welcome you here today. Um, I've been uh, teaching a series on as God the Father of all, and so I'm going to kind of go over that a little bit. You know, what our goal is at the church is not to offend the, the average church growers of America and that kind of thing. What, what we're trying to do is figure out what the early church believed in the first five centuries. And um, <clears throat> I don't know if you know, but most of the church believes what has been taught from the 16th century to the 21st, which is the last five, but many of those things are in contradiction with the first 500 years with the apostles who walked with Jesus, who were taught by the apostle John um, and the apostle Paul. And uh, for the first, especially 400 years, there was a lot of belief systems. And then other teachers came in in the 1100s, the 1600s, and decided that they had a little bit clearer revelation, so they changed a lot of the doctrine that was the original 500 years. How many know I would prefer, as a pastor, to know what the Apostle John taught, what, what Peter actually taught, what their disciples in the first two centuries especially were taught. And so we've endeavored to do that along the journey, and we're not trying to, like, you to go to the average Christian out there and then prove them wrong on their doctrine. That is not why we're doing this. We're not doing this for you to go on whatever, Facebook or whatever you want to do, and say, you know, your doctrine of, of Jesus being punished, of God turning his back on him, God being mad at Jesus, all that kind of thing. We're not there for you to get in some argument with the average Christian about was Jesus punished, did God actually turn his back on him. All we did is go to the scriptures and show you where they get it from in Psalms, and in that, Jesus felt like the Father, because he was fully human and fully God, he felt like he got his back turned on him by God, just like all of us would say in a terrible trial. How many have ever been there? Felt like, okay, where are you, God? I'm in all-out attack, right? So if you were writing, you would say, my God, my God, where are you, and why have you forsaken me? But if you read the rest of the psalm, you'll find out that God never left him. He was always with him. In fact, he was with him on the cross. So what happens is, though, is the church over time, and I don't even know where that one, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't think that came into like the 18th or 1900s uh, with, with people. They read that and they go, oh, I got a revelation. God can't look on sin. Well, they get that out of the book of Habakkuk, where it says, God, you can't, you're so holy, Pastor Darren, I think, brought this up, you're so holy, you can't look on sin, right? But then the next line, Habakkuk says, but you do. But some guy pulled out one verse, went, you're so holy, God, you can't look on sin, ran with it, made a doctrine that the church now, as a whole, believes. You see, that's what happens. So we're not teaching things to, for you to go to the average Christian and go, you know, you're just screwed up. You know what I mean? You believe stuff that the early church... No, we're just trying to get back to, to a simplicity of the gospel, what Jesus taught, so the world will understand it and we can actually tell believe, people, you know what? God has always been your father. You know, this whole thing about, about uh, you know, well, God's the father of Christians, but Satan is the father of unbelievers because the Bible says it. It says that God, Satan is your father. Well, it says it one time, actually twice in the Bible, the mere scriptures by John, one in First John, one in John, and it's the same verse. So when do we make a doctrine out of one verse? No early church did that. 
And so they ran with that and said, well, some are God. You know, but the, then we talked about this a few weeks ago, that the devil is not the creator of anything. He manipulates, he distorts, he lies, he's the accuser. He's a, he, that's what he does. So, so our goal is to, to find out, you know, if somebody comes to me and says, well, this is what I'm finding out. Well, what, I'm not going to just shut them down. I'm going to say, well, let's go see if we can find the early church fathers in the first 200 years. If it wasn't there, you're probably making it up. That makes sense? Because don't think for a moment that I'm smarter or to have a greater revelation than the Apostle Paul who actually met Jesus on the road to Damascus and Jesus opened up the scriptures to him and showed him, don't think that we're going to have something that they did not have. In fact, if we had and understood what they have, we would actually be walking in a different dimension of sonship and authority. And that's my goal is to get back to that uh, to understanding so we walk in that uh, original dimension of, of power and it seemed they walk in a holiness also uh, and um, that sometimes the, the church today lacks. And so I want to just go over a little bit about what I covered already. One is that God is the creator. He is the father. He is the uh, one that created all things. Him and Jesus, the word. Uh, however you want to say it, they are one. Um, and so uh, when you start do going into that, you start realizing where he was, that God never left Adam. In fact, he clothed him after he sinned. Well, that should throw away the fact that God can't look on sin. Well, once Adam sinned, he should have just turned away and walked away forever from you. But instead, he clothed them. And then Cain, when he killed Abel, uh, Cain, uh, God didn't walk away from Cain. In fact, he put a mark on him and said, if anybody kills you, then it'll be worse for them. So he didn't walk away from Cain. That's like protection, the father protecting their children, right? So he didn't walk away from Cain either. The Bible says Cain turned and left the presence of God. That's the problem with mankind, is mankind has left the presence of God because they think they're bad and evil. And how many know when you think something like that, you don't want to be around somebody who is holy and righteous and all that, so you've turned and you walk away. And that's what people have done. So, so uh, I want to read you one scripture in James 3, 9, where it says, with it, we bless, talk in our tongue, the Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who are made in the likeness of God. So here James is saying all men are made in the likeness of God. With it we curse men. And so, and then uh, the interesting thing here too is many times Jesus would use, and I did this in my first sermon, Matthew 9.1, when he crossed over the boat and came to his own city, then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, this is before the cross, before anybody would be born again, before anything, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. He called him son. He could have said, man, your sins are forgiven. But he specifically in Scripture put down son to show that before the cross, before his sins were forgiven, he was a son. Okay? And there's many of these Scriptures. There's not just a few. There's, there's a lot. And I've got a lot of them. So, uh, here's another one. Um, John 10, 16, he's talking to him. He says, Another sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them I also must bring, that they may, will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. 
There's not two flocks. There's not the flock of the devil and the flock of God and the shepherd, the devil, and the shepherd, Jesus. There's one. Here's another one. Matthew 6, 8. Therefore do not be like them, for your father knows the things you need before you ask him. He's in a crowd of Pharisees, Sadducees, people who have never some that believe in him, some that don't. And in that crowd, he said, your father. That's what he told the whole crowd. In Matthew 6, 26, same thing. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor they reap into barns, yet your father feeds them. See, people have read these, and we've used it as a Christian. See, my father feeds me. The problem is, is context. Who's he talking to? Pharisees, Sadducees, unbelievers, and his followers. So he should have said, all you who follow me, your father will feed you. But you who don't father me, follow me, your father will, is the devil, and he's not going to feed you. You see, otherwise you're taking everything right out of context. So what we've, as Christians, read it through a Christian view. My father's going to take care of me. The problem is, what about the Pharisee who was there? What about the unbelievers who were there who heard the same thing and said, yeah, my father's going to feed me? Heard the same thing. So, oh, let's see. What else can I cover? They already did. Um, uh, Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. Doesn't say if you've accepted Christ, he's the father of you. Does it? Got to interact a little bit with me and talk loud so I can hear. <laughs> right? One God, one father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Really? The father is in everybody? Apparently, that's what this verse says, doesn't it? All right, let's look at another one. Acts 17. Paul, therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, he's there talking to unbelievers, and he says, without knowing him, I proclaim to you God who made the world. Um, this is Acts 17, there in verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Since he gives life to all, how many? All. Breath and all things, and he has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth, boundaries and their dwellings, Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each of us, for in him, talking to unbelievers, for in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said. For, Paul is talking to the unbelievers, we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think the divine nature is like gold and silver and stone, something shaped by art. You can't get any clearer than this verse, Paul, talking to all unbelievers. There's not one believer there, except for maybe Barnabas or something. But there's no believers there. Only he's talking to the unbelievers here that God lives and moves and has his being in you. See, you would have to do like some kind of scriptural like gymnastics to twist this one. Like, what are you going to do with it? You know, and I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. What I'm trying to do is show you how off the beaten track the church has gotten from children of God children of the devil. That's how far off track we've gotten. Then we get like, I'm better than you. Say, Kaylee's never 
had her eyes open to Jesus. I'm better than you. I'm holier than you. I'm more righteous. God loves me more than you. You're just a piece of trash in God's eyes. And that's, unfortunately, how the church has portrayed. Not came, I would never, you would never go up and say that to somebody. But your actions, our actions, my actions over time have been, I'm just better than you. God answers my prayers. He's not going to hear you. You see how we've isolated the world? Instead of told them the good news of what Jesus has done. So, we covered, aren't some uh, unbelievers sons of the devil? Well, let's look at John 8, 44, real quick. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do, for he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. There's another mere verse in 1 John. I'm not going to cover that. This is the only verse in the Bible that they use that the devil is the father of somebody. The only one. So, what I told you before, like if I mention Thomas Edison, what do you think? The father of light bulbs, right? If I mention Henry Ford, what do you think? Not the father of cars, but the father of creating an assembly line, mass-producing cars so everybody could have one. And so when we think of that, it is the, it is the ideas of, it's the thoughts. Because he just said in that verse, what is the devil? What is he the father of? Murder? No truth? Lies? Right? So all murder, all untruth, and all lies, he fathers. He's the idea behind him. He's the thought process behind, behind him. He's what, that's why he turned to Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Was he calling Peter Satan? What was he calling him? You're listening to the father of lies, this, this ideas, Peter. You need to listen to me. I'm the truth. So the only verse, and any doctrinal person will tell you, you cannot build a doctrine on one verse. And this verse is very easy to show you that it's the ideas of. So... Yeah, I think we'll go ahead and jump. There's a lot of things in Scripture where you'll read sons, sons of, and sons of disobedience. Who are the sons of disobedience? The sons of disobedience are the ones who try to make themselves right with the Father by the law. So whenever you read sons of disobedience, it is always in context of the law. Okay, so, so Jesus came and said, look, you guys are trying to get right with God by the law. It's not going to happen. And that was his big argument between them. And that's why he even called them the synagogue of Satan in the book of Revelation. Because the synagogue of Satan, obviously he's not saying they worshiped Satan in the Jewish synagogues. Right? And none of us would go, oh yeah, they're worshiping Jews, we're worshiping Satan in, the, in their synagogue. No. What he was saying is, is, is your synagogues are the idea that you can be right with the Father outside of what I'm going to do with my sacrifice and what I did at the cross. The idea of that comes from Satan. You will never be right. But they said, no. The law is right, and Jesus, you're wrong, and you're a heretic, and we don't want anything to do with you. So they were of the synagogue of Satan. The ideas that he propagated, they propagated in their synagogues. And so, so you'll find that 
Uh, that's where a lot of people get confused. It'll, it'll mention sons and sons of disobedience. And see, there's some that, that God doesn't like or whatever. But what he doesn't like is the idea that Satan has propagated that you can work your way to heaven. He said, Jesus said it's all free. So, so you'll find that a lot of sons is sons of that, or it'll be sons of covenants, like you're the son of Abraham. When he's talking about you're a son of a covenant, a covenant of faith. And so you'll find a lot of that kind of language in sonship also. So... It's interesting when we read different scriptures like, uh, uh, oh, let's see, where's it start? It starts in, um, in Romans chapter 7. And uh, it says uh, that uh, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not of him. So what we would read is, see, you're not in Christ. You're not in him. You're not part of him, right? We would think that way. But here's what it actually, when you start looking at it in the Greek lexicon, it says literally, uh, living in the flesh under the law is not of him. That's why he would say synagogue of Satan, those who tried to follow the law. So he said, living in the flesh is not of him. So... The Greek lexicon says that living in flesh under the law is not of him. If anyone, legalist Jewish law keepers, do not have, which means to have, to hold, to embrace, to hold fast to the spirit, then they're not followers of Christ, but identifying as sons of the law. So this is not about ultimate belonging, but about how God refused covenantially to acknowledge the law could get you to God. And that's what all these scriptures are about. So, here's what the mirror version says. You are not ruled by a flesh consciousness, the law of works, but by a spirit consciousness. God's spirit is at home in you. Anyone who does not see himself fully clothed and identified in the spirit of Christ cannot be himself. This is the actual literal rendering of the Greek. If you don't see yourself fully clothed in Christ. You will never be yourself. What does that mean? You're a son of God. Everybody is a son of God. But if you don't see yourself fully clothed in Christ, you never can be yourself. That means to act out, to fully embrace what God has done for you. If you don't see yourself fully clothed in Christ. That's why James 1.24 says that, that whoever looks in the mirror and uh, for he goes away from the mirror, reveals uh, what the mirror revealed and immediately forgets what manner of man he is. See, you lose sight of who you are. And that's one of the things why, why the devil's always pulling on us away from sonship. Like, you've got to be this perfect. You've got to do this or God won't accept you. You blew it again. You, you made a mistake. You looked at a girl wrong. You did this, you did that. Because he's always fathering a lie to pull you away from your true identity in Christ. And that is what he does. He fathers lies continuously. So what you have to do is see yourself fully clothed in Christ. Well, what if I made a mistake? Well, is Christ perfect? Yes. So in him. Are we forgiven already of past sins, past, present, and future? In him. So you just acknowledge that, Father, I don't know why I did it, but all I know is I'm fully clothed in Christ. That means my sins are forgiven. I'm washed in the blood of Jesus. That means I'm perfect before you. I'm righteous before you. I'm holy. And the more you see yourself fully clothed, the more sin falls off. I probably won't get quite done. Now I'm almost to where I should be.
See, one thing we have to realize in John 17, 3, it says, this is eternal life, that you may know him, the one true God in Jesus Christ who him he has sent. See, it's interesting because the, the eternal life, the life of God, how, if you don't know Jesus, you never can actually participate in the very life that he provided. So that's why people who don't know Jesus don't know what he's done, or say you look at some Christians and they're this thick, what I call very shallow, right? They don't have hardly any knowledge. So they operate in this much of who they are in him. And then you got other Christians that have a lot more knowledge. And so they walk in a lot more of who they are in Christ. They're more loving. They're more kind. They're more compassionate. They're more giving. They, they pray for people. They encourage people, right? Because they walk in more of their knowledge of who they are in him. So, here's the question. Do we have to be born again? Do we have to be born again? And what does it mean? Well, let's take a look. It might surprise you, but the born-again phrase is about 200 years old. It wasn't in the early church. They wouldn't even know what you're talking about. If you said, I got born again, and the early church would have went, what? What do you mean? You got born again. That is a 200-year-old doctrine. Okay? So what does it mean? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians 1. You know, the, you guys, the Roman road, walking the Roman road and all that stuff, uh, came with, in the late 1800s and early 1900s with Billy Sunday and then, uh, and then uh, our fam Billy Graham. All that stuff got propagated during that time period, but was never in the early church. So what does it mean? Ephesians 1. 13. In him you also, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So when you look at this, here's what happened. When you believed... When you heard the message, the Holy Spirit sealed you. He opens your eyes at that time to see the truth. This is what's happening. When you hear the truth and you accept it, you receive it. He opens your eyes. And so what he does is, he, he, when he seals you, he attests to, he guarantees the fullness of God, that now you can walk in it. What about John 3, 3, where it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Right. Surely well, I say to you, you must be born again. Be born again. Yep, and yep. And right, and we'll deal with that in a minute. So, so here, what happens is the Holy Spirit, when you hear the truth, the Holy Spirit goes, Ah, they got the truth. So he seals you and says, I'm going to open up the word to you. I'm going to open up all about Jesus to you. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to open it up. So the Holy Spirit starts to open it up. And what he basically says is this. If you listen to the Holy Spirit, everything Jesus purchase for you is yours. Ransom paid in full, everything's yours. So the difference between those who receive and accept what he's saying 
and those who don't is they don't have the seal of the Holy Spirit who opens the book to them. That's the only difference. So here's your difference. Those who don't know Jesus, don't have the seal, don't have, like, opening, like, let's say you had a book and it had a seal on it. Well, they've got, the book is here. How many of you have ever had unbelievers say, I don't understand this thing? Why? Because it's never been sealed. So what we're doing is getting proper language. The born again is not in the original, by the way. Uh, the, that phrase, it, it doesn't mean what you think it does. We think it, at, because we've been an 18th, 19th century church, we think it's when we make a confession. And I'm going to clarify that if I have time today. I'm going to clarify that, what happens. So, but what, here's what happens. Here's the seal. It's closed to you. You open it up and like, I don't understand this thing. But then somebody tells you about Jesus. And, and they're like, you know, as many as received him, the, he gave the right to become sons of God. And I'm going to go over the word receive, receive here in a moment. But what happens is, is all of a sudden you understand. You came, come to this enlightenment of the truth. Which, by the way, it's not you who does it. In Ephesians, and I'll read that scripture in a little bit. In Ephesians, it says that he does it. So somebody tells you it, it opens it up, all of a sudden the seal is opened up. So all of a sudden, you start to read Ephesians that I'm in Christ and in him and in whom, and, and I am holy and I am righteous and all that. And unless a preacher comes to you and says, no, you're only holy when you don't sin, because that's what they've done, it's like you're holy one moment, you sin, you're not holy, then I'm holy, and then I'm not holy. And that's why the church is so confused about who they are in him. So we'll, let's keep going because I, hopefully I can finish this. So, so sealed into the day of redemption means you you're, were purchased possession to acquire a possession. So here's the deal. Did truth exist before we believed it? We don't make something, we don't believe something to make it true. Truth is truth. We believe it because it's already true. Right? It's good news, something that took place in our past about our existing present tense salvation. When we believed it, the Holy Spirit marked us, and press the truth in our hearts. So what does it mean to be born again? Actually, that phrase isn't in the Bible, in the original language. Let's look at that. Jesus answered and said, John 3, 3, Verily, verily, I say to you, if anyone uh, may not be born from above, he is not able to see the reign of God. Wait a minute. Born from above? That's what the original language is. So do I have to go to heaven to get it? So let's keep looking. So Adam represented the human race, right? A greater son always existed, a greater man who is the creator himself, holding all things together, which is Jesus. He came to represent all humanity. So when were you, if you want to say born again, when did that happen? Because actually it says born from above. It happened when Jesus died on the cross for all humanity. You just received it and understood it but it already happened for all humanity. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He paid for everybody's sin. He, the one that was born from above, 
now included you in him. So we're all born from above. It's just some haven't received it yet. And the word received means to grasp, to understand. It doesn't mean for you to make a confession. It means the light bulb got turned on. That's why when you share the good news to somebody, a light bulb pops in their brain and the Holy Spirit seals them because we're all born from above because Jesus did it 2,000 years ago. Actually, from the foundation of the world, Jesus did it. Was Jesus the Son of God before? Yeah, but he emptied himself and became a man. And Je Jesus' death was so real, the Father had to rename him. Was he always the Son? Yeah. Was he always Lord? Yeah. But he emptied himself of all that. Now watch this. In Hebrews 1.5, turn to that. I'm going to try to finish this if I can. So, Jesus' death was, Jesus was so real, the Father had to rename him. His death was when he raised him from the dead. And, and Ephes, or Hebrews 1 5 says, To which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son? Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father. And again, you notice the phrase again. Because he emptied himself. Now it's again. So he emptied himself, and now he says, uh, Today I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he, at the resurrection, brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. So the firstborn, or the first one born again, was Jesus. And because we're all in him, we were all born again, at that moment. <clears throat> now look at another scripture. And uh, this was in Acts 2.36. After his resurrection, it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to become both Lord and Christ. You see, he renamed him. He, he redid it. Was he always Lord? Was he always Christ? But he emptied himself. Then he became. So you can see that to become. To become is something that happened at that moment when he died in resurrection. Then Jesus said he is now become both Lord and and Christ. So Jesus was the firstborn from the dead, or in the language that people use today, he was the first one born out of Hades or the grave. So because he was born again, we would, people would say, but really that's not in the language, born from above, we are all now, because remember, he takes away the, behold the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. So therefore, but the only difference between me, who understands and Dan, who says doesn't understand, is he doesn't know all the benefits. He hasn't opened his covenant up. He doesn't know what Jesus did. So he just lives an average life, Loving people, might love his family, might love his kids, all that kind of thing. Not knowing that God's his father, wants to help him. There's a Holy Spirit that would lead him into all truth. There's an old brother who would be there to strengthen him, help him. He doesn't know any of that. So he never ex experiences it. So he never experiences all the in him. So the first, the language of first in Greek is the idea of preeminent. He is the first. He is the preeminent one, Jesus. So let's look at 1 Peter 1.3. 1 
It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Wait a minute. When? Did, when did he do it? Now, pull that scripture up, Ken Darren, because I need to point that out. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought we had to make the confession. That's what's taught. Okay, let's look at this. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again. Or the scripture actually says, born from above to a living hope through, when did it happen? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Not when you made a confession. It happened when Jesus rose from the dead and then you were all placed in him. From the foundation, you were in him at the cross. Even when he died, when he rose again, you were in him and you were rose with him and you were born from above in him. Yeah. See, we place it when we made a confession or a belief. But the Greek language declares this. When he died, we died. When he was made alive, we were made alive. When he was raised, we were raised. When he was seated, we were seated. At the exact moment, we were born from above when Jesus rose from the dead. And the Holy Spirit now confirms that over and over and over again. I got two and a half pages to go. I think we'll make it. So doesn't Paul say that believing gives us the right to become a child of God? It seems to say that. Let's look at it. Go to... Um, Darren, go to John 1, 1. I hope I'm going slow enough where you're kind of grasping some of these concepts. I'm not trying to go too fast, but fast enough where I can hopefully get through it. Um, but the con you can re-listen to this tape and go over every single scripture. Uh, you know, go online. Uh, and that kind of thing. And because so many of these, what, what the early church believed, you guys, was everybody. Everybody. It, they believed in a, what they called the universal salvation. The first 400 years, things didn't start to change until Augustine in 365. The first 400 years, they all believed that Jesus' work was for everybody. Some believe it. Some do not, but it's still, everybody was included. What happens in the end? There's a lot of debate over that. We're not, we don't have time to go into all that. Um, okay, so let's read John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, when we would say comprehend, we would say, what would you think, like, Brittany, when I say the word comprehend, what does that mean to you? Understand. Understand. Okay? Let me show you what the Greek says. The word comprehend means this, to take eagerly. To seize, to possess it. It doesn't mean understand. In our language, you see, language changes over time. And so in our language, we'd say, well, yeah, understand. I would have said the same thing. I thought the same thing until I actually went to the Greek and just read the definition. So here's what it means. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not 
Take it eagerly. It was theirs. Seize it. Possess it. It was already theirs. It's like an inheritance that's yours, but you never take it. He, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own didn't receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. See, I told you. You have to receive him to become a child of God. That's what they will say. Um, this is John 1, verse 12. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So we understand everything was in Christ. The Father purposed it. Everything includes all humanity. Um, when he came to his own, his own didn't. See, I was taught his own were the Jews. But he just said he created everybody. But I was taught his own were the Jews and they didn't receive him. Right? But it's not talking in context there. It's not talking about to the Jews. It's talking about everybody, the whole of humanity, because he said he just created everything and everything was for him and everything was in him and he created everybody. So... To the people who, so when, when the, the word Christ came to his own, uh, to people that belonged to him, because he's the creator, they didn't receive him as one who created them. They didn't receive him as, the one who, as ones who belonged to him. So let's look at John 1.12, the right to become children of God. You have to believe or receive. Right means authority in the Greek. And the Greek word right is exousia. It comes from, uh, from, in the Greek, it's 1537, ek or out from, which intensifies 1510, emi, to be. So it basically means this, out from being or the power of living from an I am a child of God. Or that which comes from within. So you have the right, because of what Jesus did, to live from who is actually in you, which is Christ, whether you have accepted it or not, you have the ability to live from the Spirit of God, from Jesus within you. I think even sometimes the world taps into this, because he's in them. I think they tap into it at times. Why is there so much good and loving people who love their kids, love their family? Look, do you not think they have tapped into something on the inside of them? So it literally means that, that you have the right, the ability to live out of the I am a child of God that comes from within. Notice the Greek is not the word to become. It actually, the word become there means to be, to emerge. It means to come into being or manifestation implying motion. That means the moment you receive it, you go in the motion of it, and all of a sudden you start changing from a caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly. You start emerging. You have the power to be on the inside and you start emerging as this beautiful. Or you could say you got a little got baby who we're going to have here shortly and as it grows, it is emerging as a full son of God. Uh, is it a son of God? Yes, but it doesn't have the ability, the knowledge, the understanding yet. As it grows up, it, can, it emerges into a full adult full of the anointing of God and the power of God. And so along the journey, even your little kids, if they understand who they are at a young age, they can, they can show off the I am in them. You start to live out of who you are in him. Not separate from him, living out of him. So it's like a butterfly. So... The word, as many as received him. Let's deal with that. To receive means to comprehend, grasp, to identify with in the Greek. So we would think, okay, pick up your purse, hand it to me, I received it. 
But it doesn't mean that. It means purse is yours if you want it. So go ahead and say that. Thank you. I understand that. I comprehend that. I grasp that. I fully identify with that. If I want to take this purse anytime, it's mine. That's what the word means. It does not mean for her to hand it to me, me to receive it. Last half page. So the difference between a Christian and your Hindu neighbor is not ontological, but darkness and light, the ability to see the truth. Because they haven't heard it yet. Then we believe, and we accept it, and we learn to walk it out. So... When we believe it and receive it, grasp it, understand it, it's mine. All the promises are yours, right? Are you walking in them all? Come on, be honest. Nobody is. Not everything yet. But you know they're yours. Sometimes it takes a while for us to figure out how to appropriate a promise, doesn't it? I mean, we get taught, well, if you give enough, you'll get if you do this enough, you'll get. And how many know sometimes you've got to throw out those lies? Wait a minute. The promise that he'd take care of me is mine. He said the Father feeds everybody. He takes care of everybody. He didn't say that if I'm a good little uh, birdie, he will feed me. Does he? But that's what's been taught so you to comprehend, grasp that it's all free and understand it, what he's done for you, sometimes even though you see it there, like, man, I got so many cobwebs in this brain, I got to, like, filter the lies out and just go grab this purse because it's mine. She said it's mine. But we don't always do that. And then we learn to walk it out. Oh, the difference between them is not ontological, but darkness and light, the ability to see. So when somebody just says, you know, Jesus loves you so much, and he, he already took care of your sin problem, he loved, and, and if they go, I can receive that, I can understand it, I can comprehend and grasp that, then the early church, what they would do, they would immediately pray for them for the Holy Spirit. You watch that. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Why? Because he's going to be the revealer of all truth. Is the Holy Spirit in them? Yeah. But then they're sealed. When, that's why I believe the early church did this. They would lay hands on them and they'd seal them with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. They probably made confessions. I don't know. I'm just out of thinking out loud. They probably made a confession. Holy Spirit, they have received everything, understood, grasped what Jesus did. Now, enlighten them to everything. Because guess what? When you first hear the message, you don't, know, you don't know everything, what Jesus has done. So I think they prayed a prayer of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, just enlighten them. I mean, illuminate them. Show them things to come. Reveal secrets about Jesus. Tell them everything about what the cross accomplished, what the resurrection did, who they are in him. Let them walk in that. And then the Holy Spirit starts saying, now I press my seal upon them, and I'm going to start enlightening them. That's honestly, I think, because the early church was so adamant about that, that I think that a lot of churches now that do not practice that, laying hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit, I think a lot of them, even though the Holy Spirit's in them, he's trying his best to get it out, they haven't fully yielded to the Spirit of God. And I think that's where you fully yield. The gifts of the Spirit start to flow. The, the anointing of God starts to flow, even though it's still there in measure. But I, there was a reason the early church laid hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. 
And maybe we'll find that in some of the early church writings, why they believed it was so important. But I think it's because the Holy Spirit seals. It's His job to open up. It's His job to reveal all truth to us. But I think a lot of the church, they don't, they just, they don't even believe to do it. And so, you go and you hear a message there, and you can go back the next year, and it's the same 15 messages. They just repeat every message. They add another new scripture to it, and it's the same thing. Like, how many times do your people need to get born again? No, you need to learn who you are. That you can live out of the I am in you. That Christ is in you. The Holy Spirit is there at any moment. You don't have to work it out. I used to think if I prayed in tongues long enough, and pray, 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 and then I could finally hear from God. But see, that's a works mentality. The devil sows it in. You're just not going to hear by just sitting by the pool, relaxing, that kind of thing. And you know, or you're working and you're actually selling things and you're doing stuff that you can't hear during that time because you haven't totally quieted yourself, pray in tongues for a half hour, and then maybe God will talk. But see, that stopped us a lot. I'm not mocking that. I think there is a place where you're just confused. You don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. So you separate a couple days. You get away with God. That's all legitimate. I'm not mocking that at all. What I'm mocking is the idea is that we can't walk with God every day of every second knowing what he's done. Enjoying his fellowship. Walking in the spirit. Because the flesh is so opposite. You're not in the flesh anymore. You were in the flesh. You're now in the spirit. Live to walk out of that. Let's pray, and I don't know if somebody wants to come up piano, but let's just see if the Holy Spirit wants to say anything, do anything today. And um, I think He probably always does, so we're just going to try to tune in and listen. Yeah, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> He's probably trying to, trying to talk to you. Yeah. He's probably trying to. Yeah. He's trying to impress that upon you. That because most of us have been taught the other way. How many have taught if you pray in tongues a lot? I was, listen, I was one of the biggest, not boasting myself, one of the biggest tongue talkers you've ever seen. I mean, literally, I pray for an hour or two a day in, in the Spirit. That, that was normal. I'd pray for a half hour up to work half hour back home. I pray at work because we I had a job I could listen to teaching and that kind of thing. Then I'd get up, I'd come home because I got home at 1 o'clock, 1.30, take a nap, be in my room for two or three hours, pray in tongues more, study more, and then come out about 5 o'clock, eat supper, and then we'd spend the rest of the day together. That was normal. That was normal because I thought I had to to hear God. And I'm not saying I didn't hear God during that time period. We did. We did hear God a lot during that time period. But I think he wanted me to advance past that. Like there's seasons, yes. But there's times where, just listen. Just listen. What do I do, Father? What do we need to do? Where do we need to go? What do you got planned? What do do I need to make an adjustment? Let him talk to you. If you miss it and make a mistake, oh well, keep going and try to listen better the next time. Let's stand and let's just worship him. I know it's 12 after and we got our sonship tonight. Let's just worship him for a moment and just listen.
sound check, yeah. Yesterday morning I was out um, in the backyard and I was just spending time with Father. And I saw the coolest vision. And it, in a sense, the message today just kind of brought that back to me. But I saw the prodigal on the road returning home. And he was broken and filthy and sad and hungry. And uh, he didn't look so... And instead of seeing the father running to him, I saw the brother in the field. And the brother in the field saw his brother coming down the road. And the house was here and he was off here. And the father was down here. The prodigal was here. And the other brother was over here. And he took off running to his brother. And when he got to him, the brother collapsed in his arms. And he held him up. And he helped him walk further down the road. And as they were walking, the father ran to both of them. And I started to cry. I wrote a poem about it. I said, Father, what are you showing me? He said, Cindy, this is my heart. That you have this kind of heart towards your brother. That you see your brother on the road heading home because love brings someone home. That you don't stand in the field and say, oh, now you're coming home. Worthless piece of trash. Spent all your inheritance. Now you're coming home to take mine. What, why are you giving him a party? I never got a party. Instead, your heart is to run to him. In his brokenness. In the place where he's a mess. And put your arm around him and strengthen him. And help him return to Father. And I really believe that's where God is taking I just sat there and wept, but I believe that's where God is taking the church, to see our brother as ourself, to love our brother and help him return to the house. So I just wanted to share that because that was such a beautiful, I wish I could paint the picture. I wish I could actually paint that picture because we have the picture of the brother that's just a jerk. But I think God's trying to rewrite it in the hearts of Sometimes it's too, you all guys, of us. That we can get. That's why I said, I don't teach what I teach for you to go argue with another believer. I don't. If that's what you're going to do with it, then don't get this teaching. Don't re-listen to it at all. I do what I do because that maybe they'll go on and hear something. Maybe... They'll see something in your life like you're enjoying God more than I am. Why? I mean, I don't know. Maybe they'll, if they ask you a question, then you can just give them a few little ideas and, and, and let them come along. Because I think the, the, the son who stayed home, I think that's a lot of the church now. There's a lot of the church people that aren't partying, living life with, with God. They think it's a bunch of rules and they got to do it and they're kind of miserable, but they don't want to go to hell. So I think, I think God's got a plan for them too. So we don't need to alienate them. Let's not alienate anybody. Let's just worship Him for a moment and just see... Real quick, that was a beautiful picture, though, of what I believe God has planned for the whole body of Christ, for the church. Father, we worship you. Just worship him in your own way. Just We don't have to have words. Just worship him. Oh, we love you, my King. Holy Spirit, we love you. Holy Spirit, teach us, show us, reveal secrets to us. Teach us to love, Holy Spirit. 
Teach us to love like Jesus loved. Care like Jesus cared. Oh, we love you. I feel like the Holy Spirit saying there's some somebody could be more than one. It's kind of downcast in your heart. You just really, if anybody really does care, really does love you. You've been questioning a lot. Earlier when I mentioned, where are you, God? Sometimes he feels a long ways away. But sometimes you even feel a long ways away from the body of Christ, from the church, from people. And the Holy Spirit wants you to know you're so loved. Listen to this, you're so valuable. People may not always see, but I see. Be, believe the best in your brothers and sisters. Believe the best. That'll help you to experience more. But the Holy Spirit says, I want to comfort you. I want to encourage you. I want to strengthen you. I want you to know you are my son, my daughter. You're very valuable. And I have um, Pastor Deren and uh, Tasha and, and Brittany and Dan. Come up here and stand real quick. And turn around and face that way. If you felt this way, would you come up to one of them or two of them? Maybe we'll do a tag team here and and just get a, a word from the Holy Spirit. Because I, I believe the Holy Spirit's talking like thousands of words. And what else we do is pick up a couple. Because he said his thoughts about us are innumerable. If that's you, though, you felt like, I don't know, God. You see me, hear me. I don't know what's going on. Don't know if the body of Christ cares. I just don't know. If that's you, don't, please don't be embarrassed. Please don't walk away feeling that way. Because we really do love you. And the Holy Spirit really loves you. But as Amanda sings, I'm going to dismiss at this time too, but if you'd please come up and just let them pray over you and speak. And if one of you guys get a word for one of the people that come up, you're welcome to do that. I just kind of want to form a little team that to start out and you can give them words and encourage them but let's go ahead and sing and, and we will be dismissed I dismiss everybody in the name of Jesus I bless you I declare you're blessed I declare the full benefits of God are yours and the Holy Spirit's going to help you unpack them all and I thank you for your attendance I thank you for listening I thank you for your worship I thank you for your giving today Thank you for just being you. We love you. Well, go ahead and, and, and sing something, Amanda. And if you want, please come up here. And if there's more than they can handle, then we'll form a couple more teams.